Welcome to this lecture on encryption, where we focus on usability. Of our four course objectives, this material will be extremely helpful to you in learning how to analyze usability problems and their impacts in a variety of current security and privacy mechanisms, of which encryption is often a backbone. This also speaks to this recommendation I've shared before to use a three-prong approach to usable security. In this case, usable encryption is part of how we offer better user interfaces. Encryption helps mitigate against interception threats. This is necessary. In this process, we convert plain text or images or other types of content that would be in a message into ciphertext and then back again into plain text or another form of content that people can read. This helps keep intercepted messages from being understood and it predates computers. An example being the Caesar cipher, but it also enables creating better codes. This is essential for the internet. No one actually would use computing if we did not have these kinds of basic safeguards, not just for privacy, but also for security. A classic paper from 1999 in this vein is why Johnny can't encrypt. This started the, the genre in our field of why Johnny can't type papers. And the concept of Johnny, this is just saying something about folk or non-experts or regular end users who are not as good as we are perhaps at the technical side of security. And this paper was one of the first to talk about usability specifically for security. And its focus is on PGP. Now this is a really interesting technology. The acronym stands for pretty good privacy because we can't have privacy without encryption. And this is the origin of some concepts that we taught back in week two for usable security. You should go back to the, actually those readings and note the similarities. In this diagram here that I've pasted on the slide, it's a nice summary of how PGP encryption works. Now let's contrast this. If I go back to this kind of elementar elementary cipher where you simply shift the letters to one side. In PGP, user A wants to send user B an email. User B generates what's called a public and private key. User B keeps the private key and sends back the public key. User A encrypts the message using the public key. User A sends the private encrypted message. And then user B decrypts the message with the private key. And this type of key encryption is very valuable because it is asymmetric. I'll explain a little bit more in a subsequent, uh, subsequent slides in this course what I mean by that. But to recap, methods used in why Johnny can't encrypt are really interesting to us in this context of usability. Like a lot of other studies in usability, they used a cognitive walkthrough coupled with user testing. They recruited 10 people. They gave them a set of tasks to do that are standard, such as sending an email with encryption. And there are some screenshots in the paper, if you look it up, to help explain what the interface looked like to participants. And you can see from the ones I reproduced here, this was pretty early in computing, so our graphical user interfaces were pretty elemental. There are a couple takeaways that I would like you to think about from this paper. Even if you don't actually go back and read it, you should know these. First of all, general HCI principles don't always apply well to security software. And that's because we have some very specific requirements that are necessary. And that's different than many consumer applications. It's also important to keep in mind that attractive software, if it looks nice, has a nice look and feel for the time, it's not necessarily intuitive. And that's actually a big problem with encryption that people just can't get it often just by looking at an interface. Another takeaway from this paper that we've seen, unfortunately, in sub subsequent research, sending an email with encryption is simply not an easy process. 
And also usability evaluation is important to know what users you are targeting because not every user is alike. And we'll have groups or even as we talked about with personalization, perhaps we can use machine learning to figure out how we can better customize our interfaces for the needs of the person sitting in front of it. There are some other points that you should know too about this. What this paper shows that some problems may not be what we call real problems that we find say with a cognitive walkthrough or even a heuristic evaluation. So if something is important enough, we need to follow up with some real users, some non-experts in HCI or users who are new to the specific tool. Because as experts, there's only so many problems that we personally can catch. Also in this paper, they only looked at one piece of software. And so that's something to consider too when you weigh how to apply the lessons of this paper. Um, and that's something uh, you might want to look at a whole class of different types of brands or specific variations of a piece of software if you really wanna draw some firm conclusions, such as say, if you're using um, different types of digital forensics tools or other things in the security space. And I'd also like to close by just reminding you of some tips I gave you earlier about how to read a research paper, such as the Johnny paper. First of all, ask yourself, what was the goal of the study? This is usually going to go beyond the usability of one application. It's important to reflect on what have others learned up to now? Does the paper address a gap? So papers, if they're really well written, will help catch you up on what are all the recent findings up to its publication. What were their methods or procedures? How realistic are they? What are the limitations? There always are some limitations. Who were their participants? How did they recruit them? How many did they have? What metrics or data were collected? How were they analyzed? And were they done in a rigorous manner? And what are the conclusions? Do they follow from the data? How biased are the conclusions? Because we know humans do tend to put a little bit of bias into all their interpretations. And finally, what are the implications? And that's most important. What can I learn from this study? That's the goal of all academic research papers and also industry white papers. They're written so people can find something of value that they can take away. Thank you for listening. I'll see you in class.